Welcome, everyone, to this, the first podcast uh, focused solely on pediatric hospital medicine. My name is Dr. Tony Tarcici. I'm a MedPeds trained physician. Now, uh, before we get started with introductions, we have some housekeeping issues to go about because this is for CME credit. I have two guests with me today. Um, I have Drs. Basil Zatelli and Sarah McIntyre. Uh, Dr. Zatelli is the Edwin, Edmund R. McCluskey Professor of Pediatrics and Medical Education. Uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He's chief of the Paul C. Gaffney Diagnostic Service at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh at UPMC. Um, in addition, he you probably know him as the editor of the Atlas of Pedi- Pediatric Physical Diagnosis. Dr. Sarah McIntyre is a professor of pediatrics and a division member at the Paul C. Gaffney Diagnostic Service at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC and also one of the associate editor at the Atlas of Pediatric Physical, for the Atlas of Pediatric Physical Diagnosis. And I am Dr. Tony Tarcici. I am an assistant professor in the Paul C. Gaffney Diagnostic Service at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh with UPMC. And I have uh, nothing to disclose. And Tony, um, I also have nothing to disclose. I have nothing to disclose also, Dr. Tarcici. So there's a few reasons where I decided to create this podcast, focused, focused solely on pediatric hospital medicine topics. First, as you all know if you're listening, the, the pediatric hospital medicine field is changing and growing rapidly. Um, very soon it has the potential to become its own board certified specialty. So I thought a podcast solely based on it would be a, a good idea at this point. And I do believe there has to be a lot of you that are similar to me, right? We, we are physicians, we work, um, or we're healthcare professionals, we work, we have families, we have lives, we have activities we enjoy doing or want to enjoy doing. We also have other things that take our attention, such as house, buying food and laundry and things of that nature. And one of the things that, that for me is hard to get to is keeping up with uh, the medical literature. It is cumbersome and challenging. And I do my best. One of the areas I'd like to take advantage of is the car, meaning my car ride to work and back is roughly 20 to 30 minutes. So I thought to myself, it'd be great if I could get CME credit for being in the car and listening to something that was good and entertaining and gave me uh, some knowledge I may not have had or reinforced knowledge I do have, which is why I created this. So I'm hoping that that's what happens. So... This is our first po- podcast, and, I ha- and it's on the history of pediatric hospital medicine. I thought since it was the first, we might as well talk about how we got to this place we're at, which is now becoming our own board-certified specialty. Now, before you switch it off or decide to tune into something else, um, I have a pretty unique perspective on this, which I don't think has been talked about before. In fact, I know it hasn't. So, before we dive in, let's define a hospitalist, because we all have to make sure we're talking about the same thing. One of the most common definitions used is by Dr., and if I pronounce, mispronounce anyone's name, I'm just going to apologize for him now, because I'm going to do my best. Dr. Wachter, and he said, physicians just spend at least 25% of their time serving as the physician of record for hospitalized patients who have been referred by primary care physicians, and then who are referred back to their primary care physician at the time of discharge. And this came from his article in Medical Practice Management, 1997, Hospitalists in the Role in the American Healthcare System. So typically when anyone discusses the history of hospitalist medicine, both on the adult and the pediatric side, the first article that's referenced of starting it all is the New England Journal of Medicine, Volume 335, Number 7, 7, August 15th, 1996, which, believe it or not, is over 20 years old now, which is surprising, by Dr. Doctors Robert Wachter and Lee Goldman, and it's titled The Emerging Role of Hospitalists in the American Healthcare System. So in this paper, now, they forecast things that have come about. They discuss the anticipated rapid growth of the hospitalist physician, which has occurred. They discuss the parallels between ICU physicians in how doing only inpatient care for 12 months may lead to burnout. Also on the premium that will be placed on clinical quality improvement and the development of practice guidelines. Additionally, they talk about the positive impact hospitalists may have on trainees or training. 
It's eerie or impressive, I guess, depending upon your perspective, how many of their predictions have come about. Now, let's take a step back. Worldwide, if we're talking about the whole world, there is some precedence to our system. Going all the way back to 1947, and remember this is two years after World War II, in the United Kingdom there was a paper in the British Medical Journal by Dr. J.C. Spence titled The Care of Children in the Hospital, which at that point in the United Kingdom began calling for more specialized inpatient pediatric physicians. Now that was a long time ago, and that's the oldest paper I could find on this topic. We know um, that the United Kingdom pediatricians serve more as a consultant role in the inpatient and the outpatient side, and their system is different than ours. So then what about ours? Is that paper by Dr. Wachter in 1996 really the oldest? Well, I'm here to tell you I I don't think so, and it's going to depend on your perspective, and I'm going to walk you through it. So I'm looking at a journal of pediatrics, June 1988. This is a paper titled Consultative Pediatrics, a Role for the Generalist in an Academic Setting. The authors are Drs. Carlton Gardner, Dr. Basil Zatelli, Dr. Jeffrey Malatek, Dr. Andrew Urbach, and Dr. Robert McGregor. And we know one of the authors is here with us. I'm going to briefly discuss or summarize the paper, and then we're going to talk to Dr. Zatelli and Dr. McIntyre a little bit. So this paper discusses the role of what they call the academic generalist. This is defined as a physician employed by the hospital who is a consultant for outpatient primary care physicians in the community. So far, it's sounding good. If the PCPs had one of their patients admitted, they could ask this academic generalist to manage their inpatient stay. And these academic generalists were mostly based on the inpatient side. In addition to patient care activities, they also had teaching responsibilities and scholarly activities, which is what pediatric hospitals have. So in the definition of the the summary I've given so far, if you replace the word academic generalist with pediatric hospitalist, it sounds exactly the same. It also discusses the management of medically complex patients. Remember, at that time nationally, these patients were typically managed by subspecialists who are historically hospital-based. The argument was this academic generalist can decrease the fragmented care that could arise in that setting and coordinate care for the patient. Now, in all fairness, this was argued to be done on the inpatient and the outpatient side, meaning the primary care physician could request a consultation on the outpatient side with the academic generals to help coordinate care. So the question was to me, why isn't this counted as the first paper discussing pediatric hospitals medicine? Now, it doesn't call it hospitalist, which is, I think, a downside. Um, At the time, that wasn't a term. This was eight years before Dr. Wachter's initial paper, so it was a while before. Dr. Wachter's paper was in the New England Journal, and New England Journal is what a lot of adult practitioners read, and there are more adult physicians, and we know for hospitalist medicine, when it initially took off, it took off faster and stronger on the adult side, simply because there's more patients. So, Dr. Satelli, my question to you, um, when you guys, when you wrote this paper, was this something you all had been doing, and for how long had you been doing it for? Well, we had been doing hospitalist work since the mid-70s. Dr. Paul Gaffney, who was kind of the founder of our group, uh, who was a hematologist-oncologist by trade, but in fact was a superb general pediatrician as well, had hospital-based practice for his hematology-oncology But because he was a superb diagnostician, pediatricians around western Pennsylvania frequently referred their complex diagnostic patients to him for diagnosis. This was actually done both on an ambulatory as well as inpatient service. So he would admit the patients and evaluate them, come to a diagnosis, treat them appropriately, and then refer them back to the primary care physician. Notably, however, the ambulatory component occurred as well, in which patients were referred to him in his ambulatory clinic, and he would do the same on an outpatient basis and refer, ultimately refer them back to the primary care physician. He may follow them for a period of time, but ultimately he never replaced the primary care physician. 
he served as an ambulatory consult physician at that time. So this was the, he had been doing it probably since the mid-1950s, and in the mid-70s, he began taking on additional partners. And from that time, this particular group, our group, uh, has changed and evolved and grown over that period of time. So uh, take me back, we talked about this from the 50s, take me back to the, to the 70s or so. Um, are we the only, were we the, was this group in Pittsburgh the only group doing this, or were there other centers like this in the country where they would do manage the patient for the physicians on the inpatient side on the pediatric part? I'll be honest, I don't know if there were. I wouldn't be surprised if there were. We do know that across the country in major institutions that there were people like Dr. Gaffney who had that special expertise, not only in a subspecialty, but recognized as excellent general physicians and frequently had patients referred to them for non-subspecialty issues or problems. So in essence, perhaps they were the first hospitalists. Um, Ultimately, as to whether a particular group was formed Prior to the mid-1970s, if there were, they were very, very few in number. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zatelli. Let me ask you a question then. Um, would you, what percentage of your work on DRG, going back to the 80s, 70s, however far you want to go back, what percentage do you think was inpatient versus outpatient? Well, that evolved over time. Um, Early in my career in the mid-1970s and early 1980s, uh, I had a somewhat greater proportion of ambulatory consultation activity than I do right now, for example. Approximately uh, at this time, uh, I would say probably 85% of my time is hospitalist work spent time in the hospital taking care of hospitalist patients. The remainder of the clinical time uh, is seeing patients in our diagnostic clinic. Early in the uh, days of our uh, diagnostic uh, service history, we spent much more time uh, in our diagnostic clinic than we do now per person. Uh, so I would say uh, probably uh, 70% of my time was hospitalist time at that time, and the remainder was ambulatory consultation clinic. And was that similar for the rest of the original group, or were you an outlier for any reason? No, I was not an outlier. Uh, we all did pretty much the same thing in the group. Um, now, now this is your paper you wrote with your colleagues, Dr. Garden, Dr. Erbach, and, and the others. Do you feel this paper is the first one really defining what a hospitalist is without using the word? Well, at that time, our review of the literature really did not indicate any other organized group uh, that had published their experience. Uh, So that particular paper from our group, as far as I know, was the first report describing a group of people whose specific responsibility was to take care of hospitalized general pediatric patients. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to continue on. So, thank you. One of my favorite quotes I've discovered while researching this topic is, the general pediatrician who specializes in inpatient practice rides the wave of the future. That's by Dr. Vincent Mena, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, in the general pediatrician's future. And that's from Peds in Review in December 1990. He did discuss in his paper what became to be a reality of competing demands of having a busy and efficient outpatient practice while trying to take care of sick inpatients. It simply couldn't be done as expeditiously and as safely for the patients as having a physician in the hospital who's always there to it. In fact, numerous papers and our own Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh financial analysis told us that the outpatient physician loses significant productivity 
but having to drive to the hospital to see their patients. In our example in Oakland, it was in the city of Pittsburgh, parking was an issue, and so it was cumbersome for physicians to come, especially from farther out. So speaking of finances, let's talk about the financial aspect of pediatric hospital medicine. So one of the first questions people ask is, do hospitalists make enough revenue or enough billing or enough money to cover their own bills, their salaries, their perks, their health insurance, all of that? The flat answer is just no, <laughs> they don't. Um, there was an, an article in 2009 titled Assessing the Value of Pediatric Hospitals Programs, the Perspective of Hospitals Leaders. It was written by Gary Fried and Keeley Durham and Kara Switowski. And they basically took 761 hospitals and they sent letters, uh, surveys. They got about 213 back. Of the 213 hospitals, 112 had confirmed pediatric hospitals programs. Remember, this is in 2009. They surveyed the CEO, the president, the CFO, the CMO, or designated hospital leader from each of the 112. Then they wanted to gain an understanding of the nature of the pediatric hospitalist investment. Um, of the 112 that surveys that went out, 77 returned them but only 65 were used because 12 of those hospitals stopped using hospitals. The results are interesting. 78% of the hospitals that have pediatric hospitals medicine are subsidized by the hospital, and they range from 30,000 to 1.765 million. The average is half a million dollars, $504,000. So the hospitals leaders that reported subsidizing their components of their pediatric hospitals programs were 96%. And 54% of them actually subsidize physicians' professional benefits and program administration, and some through the operate about 90% through the operating budget, and then 82% of those, not 49, did not plan on ever phasing out the subsidy because they didn't anticipate the hospital to be ever the hospitalist to ever be able to, to make up their costs. But 18% thought that, the, that they be, there would become revenue neutral at least. And they were going to do that by doing consultations in other units, increase referrals, and expanding to other markets. And there's some at a delivery service and a sedation program, which we now know is the cornerstone of a lot of hospitalist programs. So let's talk about the interest in hospitalist medicine. Remember, that increased due to the, really starting to the 2003 ACGME work hour resident restrictions. Um, and then in 2010, the ACGME limited first-year residents more, and that's really when they began seeing an increase in hospitalist usage. So since we're, we've increased using it, we have to discuss in what areas has pediatric hospital medicine proven to be better than the previous system. And to be honest, this was a question that was more important maybe five or seven years ago. At this point, it just seems that the horse is out of the barn. In our healthcare climate, I just I don't see us going back to the old system, which is a primary care physician would admit their own patients and come see them. But it's just an interesting topic to talk about. So when you talk about it, you have to ask yourself what, how you're going to measure if a hospital system is successful. And the way it's done in the literature, they talk about length of stay, readmission rate, cost, and mortality. I, and when I examined this, I decided not to go farther back than 2004. And this is an arbitrary point in time just because I felt that the, the research was better after that. I'm going to quickly talk about a few studies and just bring up a couple of points and then we're going to move on. So the studies I liked, the, the one was by Conway et al. in 2006. And this is a national provider survey. It's done via survey. Everyone reported the frequency of use of diagnostic tests and therapies on a five-point Likert scale. They compared 213 hospitalists with 352 community pediatricians in their survey responses. What they found at that point was that hospitalists were more likely to follow evidence-based guidelines for VCUG and renal ultrasound after a first UTI. This is back in 2006. And albuterol and ipratropium in the first 24 hours for asthma. They also found that hospitalists are less likely to use the following unproven therapies leave albuterol and inhaled or oral steroids for bronchiolitis, stool culture or rotavirus testing for gastro, or ipratropium after the first 24 hours for asthma. So that was one for the hospitalists. Then there was a paper by Srinivasta et al. in 2007 from the University of Utah where they compared 
1,970 patients with asthma, dehydration, and viral illness. This was a retrospective cohort study done from 93 to 98. It compared length of stay and cost. Length of stay for the hospitalists was shorter for asthma and for dehydration by uh, 13% and 11% respectively. And there was no length of stay difference for patients with viral illness. And the costs were lower for asthma and for dehydration with hospitalists. So that worked out well. A couple others we'll talk about. The next one is Conway and Karen in 2009. This was the first multi-center 25 children's hospital study. This was 20,892 patients identified with UTI in the FIS database. It's a retrospective cohort study. In this one, they compared hospitalists with, at that point, still primary care physicians admitting their own patients, and they actually found no difference in cost, no difference in performance of evidence-based medicine guidelines for VCOG and rule out ultrasound for the first UTI. This was one of the only ones, but this was the largest one that really, that was done comparing the two sides and really didn't find a difference. And what, what we've kind of, and there was also an excellent review in the Journal of Hospitals Medicine by Grant Musman in April 2012, which was the most recent review that I found, and I really liked it, titled Pediatric Hospital Systems Versus Traditional Models of Care, the effect on quality and cost outcomes, which examined all the studies and, and more. And one of their findings, which I thought was good, was hospitals can improve the quality and efficacy of inpatient care in the pediatric population, but the effect is not universal, and mechanisms underlying demonstrated improvements are poorly understood. And I thought that was interesting because at this point, most pediatric hospitals have a large catchment area. Our catchment area, I believe, is all of western Pennsylvania, parts of Ohio, parts of West Virginia, parts of New York. And I was wondering if I could ask our guests, has it always been this large, our catchment area? Has it steadily grown over the past few years? We've always had a large catchment area. Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh uh, is the only tertiary or quaternary hospital for children in western Pennsylvania. So we always have had a very large catchment area. Um, so this, I think, has contributed in a great way to our ability to have hospitalists uh, and be able to provide care for children whose families live far away, whose primary care physicians cannot come and see the patient in the hospital. So for the PCPs that lived far, that, that worked farther away, my assumption is when, when the DRG, the Diagnostic Referral Group, started taking over, were they happy to give their patients over because of the length of the drive to the hospital and the sheer commute? I believe that to be the case. Um, many physicians uh, expressed to us um, individually that it was a relief um, that they could send a patient in to someone they had spoken to um, who agreed to accept the patient and transfer and who would then communicate with them by phone and by letter after the visit was over um, what had transpired. Now, and that's one of the things that, if you looking at the research and literature, it really comes back to hospital systems need to be very local. So what works in Newark, New Jersey may not work in Pittsburgh. What works in Pittsburgh may not work in L.A. or Philly. And every, every specific system, as you all know, has to address the concerns of the local PCPs and the community. Which brings us to one of our next points, which is for those of you who may be designing a new hospital system, or looking at your model of call, which it's, it's in the literature. It's something we've, we've discussed and we've been talking about for a long time. So briefly, there's 24-7 call versus on-call. Those are the types of model of staffing of a hospital service. The 24-7 model requires approximately five full-time equivalent hospitalists to provide a single coverage of a single team. There's no data to support the fact that having an attending in the house 24-7 would improve care, safety, and outcomes, but it does make intuitive sense. The on-call from home model could be more attractive to hospitalists as weekend and nighttime burdens are significantly less depending upon patient volume and, ac and acuity. Um, and of course, nurse practitioners, PAs, and residents can help with this. If you're going to make a schedule, there's three basic models that are available at this point, the traditional, the block, and shift work. The traditional model is Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and alternating weekends. 
This works well for academic centers, provides good continuity of care, and works well in the larger pediatric hospital settings. The block model is very popular with adult hospitalists, where you work 12 hours on, 12 hours off, increments of five to seven days in a row, followed by an equal amount of time off. And then there's shift work. Uh, what I want to discuss is our model uh, because it's a little different than other models I've seen. Uh, so the way ours works is we have three types of scheduled physicians. So we have a day, we'll call a day group, uh, which come in 7.30 to whenever the work is done, anywhere from 4 to 5 p.m. We have an evening hospitalist group, um, and that's a group of physicians that will work one out of four weeks uh, from 4 p.m. to midnight, uh, covering the later admissions, and then we'll work, a, we'll work one out of four weekends. And then we have a, a purely hospitalist team, the orange team, and that's a five full-time equivalent physicians who cover one service. They cover one team together, but it's 24-7. They have very limited teaching, meaning they may have a third-year resident, but they do not have medical students or anything like that typically. Recently, they've added a nurse practitioner, but that wasn't always the case. And uh, when you're being, uh, when you decide to work for the diagnostic referral group, it depends on where the positions are that you may pick. Um, and the evening hospitalists, they only work one out of four weeks as on the evening, and the rest of the time they work during the day. So I, I guess uh, my first question to both of you is, when did that system start evolving like this? Well, Dr. Tarchici, the, the system evolved according to the needs of the division in the hospital. And I think this is a universal phenomenon among hospitalist uh, programs. Uh, the structure of the program really is dependent upon the, the needs of the, uh, of the hospital uh, and department. Initially, we had the standard uh, call from home uh, structure and model. Uh, then the evening hospitalist program was developed, and so that uh, began having more shift work in the evenings uh, during which they worked. The more recent addition of the limited teaching service or 24-7 orange team required that we do pure shift work for covering 24-7. So as the demands upon the group and the hospital changed, so did the call system. And so the call systems varied uh, among the different responsibilities of the various uh, requirements. And so I will tell you from a personal example, um, Having the flexibility, so if you're, if you're listening and you're designing or in the midst of designing or considering redesigning your hospital system in terms of the call, uh, the pluses of this system are you can pick what works best for your life. Um, for me specifically, I did the Orange Team when I first arrived in Pittsburgh. My wife was a fellow, and our schedules were hectic, so I did a lot of overnights, which worked well at that point picking up the kids and doing this and that. Um, and it was nice to have that flexibility. And then as that changed, I moved to the evening group for being awake more during the day. Um, and that flexibility, I think, is a plus. Uh, and a group that works well together, we have all covered uh, different aspects of the group whenever there's someone out for an illness or return leave or anything, uh, which is nice. Collegiality helps. Uh, do, you, do you think the system the way it is has any negatives, Dr. McIntyre? Well, I think there are always going to be uh, a few number of people who prefer to work nights for different reasons. But in general, I think doing overnight shifts um, is more of a downside for some people than it, than it is for others. Um, I think given adequate time to rest in between shifts, most people accommodate very, very well. Um, I think the uh, advantage of the other structures, um, or the, the other systems, is not working overnights. Um, and the presence of the evening hospitalist uh, shifts some of the burden for on-call or call at home 
onto the evening people who are here and who are working. So that's an example where one of the systems improved the other the other system. Um, you know, I think uh, all of us in medicine are committed to working very hard, and the fewer number of people you have, the harder each individual person is going to work. So I think uh, having an expanded group of physicians, having different schedules, lends a flexibility and an ease of burden that you wouldn't have in a very small program with limited numbers of faculty. Dr. Tarchichi, one of the things that you had talked about is the ability to move from one call system to another. One of the downsides of that is whether there is a position available in the other call system. So, for example, you moved from overnights into an evening hospitalist position. But there is not always an evening hospitalist position open or available to allow that transition. Uh, And so sometimes uh, people who, for family reasons or many other reasons, want to change their call may find it difficult to do that if there isn't a position open to move into. So that, I think, is one disadvantage. So that, and I think one of your one of your points that I would like to talk about for a second is how each system has to be specific for an indiv- for what's going on in the community. And a great example of that is a paper written in the Hospital Pediatrics, December two thousand fifteen, Volume Five, Issue Twelve, by Christine Hrush and Carolyn Smith, Hrack and Carolyn Smith, successful implementation of a referral based academic pediatric hospital service. And the summary is, I thought this was interesting because it was all borne out by highway construction. In St. Louis, there are three, air, three hospitals where a child can be admitted. Uh, there's St. Louis Children's Hospital, and then there's a the large community hospital, another academic hospital. Well, in 2008, there was a large highway construction which closed a major interstate, and it severely impaired access to St. Louis Children's Hospital. And at that point, private PMDs could still admit their patients there, and they would drive and admit. Well, with this new construction, it was going to be cumbersome, and the hospital themselves felt they were going to lose admissions to their competitors. So they developed this uh, consult service called SHARP, S-H-A-R-P. Uh, they basically had, they had a general medicine pediatric ward service. They took some of their more experienced uh, hospitalist attendings, not spe- subspecialty attendings, and put them on the SHARP group to where a private pediatrician, if they wanted to admit their patient, they could admit them to the SHARP group. They promised 24-7 access uh, to a cell phone number. They would get a phone call on admission, a phone call on discharge, and if anything pertinent happened, such as, I guess, an ICU stay, uh, they would get a phone call, and they would get a faxed discharge summary. And, they were, and this was a non-teaching service, but covered by uh, residents overnight. And at that point, then they compared this SHARP group to the traditional general medicine service. And I guess not surprisingly, the SHARP group had a decreased length of stay and decreased cost com- uh, compared to those admitted to the general medicine service. And I should, I should say I omitted, the general medicine service could have been and was staffed by subspecialty attendings for a period of time as well. So they all do rotating blocks. Uh, And the cost difference was significant. The general medicine group had a cost of $3,062 per admission, whereas the SHARP group had $2,719. That's $2,719. The length of stay for the SHARP group was two days, whereas the general medicine group, it was three days. I thought that was a nice example of how highway construction caused a change in, a positive change for the patients. So... Let's talk about the future of the future of pediatric hospital medicine briefly. As you all know, the American Board of Pediatrics has recently approved pediatric hospital medicine to become a board-certified specialty. The next step is the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is the overseeing body for all of the specialty boards, to approve that approval. Um, they had an open comment period till August 19th, and I believe their next meeting is in October. Um, and in October, we'll find out. They can either say yes or say no or table a discussion to a later time. So we will hopefully know something before the next calendar year 
as to what the American Board of Medical Specialties will say. As a historical point, they've never said no to the American Board of Pediatrics. It doesn't mean they can't, it just means as of now, they haven't, so it will be a first. I think we're running out of time for the show. I did want to ask Dr. McIntyre one other question, and there wasn't a good place to put it in, so I'm just going to ask you. So in terms of pediatrics, pediatrics has been and is known as a, a female-friendly specialty, whatever that means in terms of scheduling, in terms of time off from maternity, even in terms of part-time work available. Has that always been the case? So when this group was started and in the beginning, or just in general, has, that, has pediatrics always been that way? Honestly, I would have to say that the culture of work when I arrived here was more traditional in that uh, everyone was expected to work full-time, work a lot, and I think it has evolved to a better system that reflects more accurately the complexity of lives today, and, and in my case, the, the lives of women who are also working mothers um, and who are, by and large, when married, uh, married to spouses who also work outside of the home. And I think that's where the crunch time has often come up for, for women, to have a working spouse outside of the home, uh, where schedules, you know, who's going to pick up, who's going to drop off the kids, um, what's going to happen when both partners are on call, especially on a weekend, coordinating time off, vacations, with working spouses who also have very complicated schedules. Um, when I came here, I think that um, that was an area that was um, more challenging, um, but has gotten uh, significantly better, largely through having a group of people who were willing to look at um, the needs of the physicians employed in a, in a more holistic sense. So I think things have gotten better over time. I think they could yet get better. Um, we have a ways to go yet. And I think that's pertinent now, especially as in the field, more men are taking paternity leave more than ever before. So having a, a group that would will cover and can cover for anyone leaving it for any reason, such as paternity, maternity, uh, an illness in a family or someone, it, it, I think it does help. That's good to know. I, I would agree. If, may I, do I have time to make of one course, more comment? Yeah. Um, the presence of uh, newer, younger women with children um, has also brought the issue up uh, more acutely. Um, and there has been tremendous flexibility within the group for latitude in when someone comes in and when they leave based on um, what their particular needs are. I think the work always gets done, and I think that the cooperation of individual faculty members towards the greater good of the group is very important. And that brings up a point which I failed to mention prior when we were talking about the scheduling system. We brought up our orange team. I wanted to bring up that in case anyone is considering it, one of the benefits is if you're a new faculty member, someone out of residency, or even eventually out of fellowship, having a service where there's less, less of a teaching component may be nice in terms of confidence, in terms of uh, developing and honing your craft, figuring out your style when I did it, I came here from another area of the country. I had never used our particular EMR. I didn't know our hospital system. So even being able to take a year or two to learn that prior to having to do with learners and medical students, obviously residents, uh, along with you and having to teach them, I found to be helpful, and I'm glad I did the, team, I did the orange team first. And in that, I will say 
I think we have come to the end of our discussion. Um, I hope this was helpful for anyone listening. Uh, the next podcast topic, which I hope to release in four to six weeks, after this, I, I, pr- I think they're all going to be more, um, uh, clinic- more clinical. And so my next topic is going to be osteomyelitis, and I'm hoping to do a review uh, of it and of an update in the literature, uh, pediatric osteomyelitis. If you are listening and have any topics you wish to, for us to talk about um, or bring up, please feel free uh, to send a message through the website, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to do it. Um, we'll be happy to. And I want to say uh, thank you to my, to my guests, Dr. Basil Telly and Dr. Sarah McIntyre. And I want to acknowledge uh, people who helped. Uh, Dr. Daniel Rausch in uh, Mount Sinai, um, he was kind enough to send me his slides for this particular topic and some of them I've used here. And, of course, uh, Dr. Megan Keen tarcici who helps me a lot. Uh, so for now, thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you, and we'll see you next time.